let's uh, let's get into it. What we're going to cover. We're going to share with you uh, updates and changes in the law that may affect you. Who actually invests with trusts and things like that? Who does that? Okay, good. I forgot to ask, actually, who is a property investor as well? Wow, look at that, Julio. See that, mate? How many is, who, who's not an improperly investor but wants to be? Okay, great. Thank you. Well, we're going to share with you updates and changes in the law that may affect you. We're also going to share with you some possible solutions to these. And then I'm going to share with you or tell you about a brand new accounting firm that I've set up, which is called Efficient. So it's the word efficient spelled with an A because we're much more than efficient, we're efficient. So my, my goal is this will become a word in the English language, you see. People will say, that's not very efficient. Well, we'll talk to you about that. Now, disclaimer, tonight is an information only night. A lot of people think that I'm an accountant. Um, I'm actually not. I did study accounting and I could tell you some interesting accounting jokes at this point, but, but I'll refrain because I know we've got a few of my accounting friends in the audience. But the, the information I'm sharing with you tonight is actually more of a legal nature than it is an accounting nature. And the reason I, I, uh, I have the right to stand up here and talk to you about it is because this is how I set up my businesses or I, or I set up my investing. And what I found is, is that the legal profession and the accounting profession rarely meet. Uh, when I was running uh, the firm Chan and Naylor Accounting, we, we hired uh, lots of accountants during my two-year tenure there. And we hired about 48 in the first 12 months. And it was a constant surprise to me how much we had to train our accountants that came on board in the legal aspect of the profession until I started to realise that it was no one's really taught this or the accounting field had generally not taught it as much. So it's, it's actually quite difficult to find the, get the experience of the legal side utilising the tax side. Does that make sense? So um, thankfully I've uh, dealt with a lot of very experienced and high-end tax lawyers who specifically focus on the legal aspect of the tax law and also the implementation of it and then having to try and implement these, these methodologies in business or investing. So what I'm sharing with you tonight is basically how I go about doing things and uh, what works for me. Does that make sense everyone? But if you're going to go out and apply any of this stuff, you don't do it off the back of what I teach you tonight. You need to obviously sit down with somebody who knows what they're talking about and assesses your situation and, and ultimately take it from there. So, reason why we use structures. There are three reasons and only three reasons that you want to set up a trust or use a structure when it comes to investing. One is asset protection. The other is estate planning. And the third is flexibility or tax. We'll go through these in a little bit more detail, what each are, but I just wanted to point out to you that the tax reason is often the reason most people will go for. However, our law, or in our law, we have a, a particular section of the tax law that's called Part 4A. And Part 4A, written in the Roman numeral style, which they love, simply means this. If you use a trust structure or whatever you use and your sole reason is to do it for tax purposes, then you can't do it. Now this gives trusts and different uh, structures and setups a bad name. Who has heard that the ATO are clamping down on trusts and you shouldn't use a trust anymore? Who's heard that? Hands nice up high. Okay, great. Okay, about a third of you. This is often enough for most people to stop doing it. Um, and the reason given is, is that trusts are bad or the ATO don't like them and all the rest of it. Well, let me just give you a bit of an analogy here. Let's say you drive a Volvo. And if you drive it like a typical Volvo, Volvo driver, you will rarely hit anybody or anything. Right? You go slow and you're careful. Now, if you get in that car and you run somebody over on purpose, who's at fault? You or the car? You are, that's right. You can blame it on the car, but if it's a Volvo, they're not going to believe you. <laughs> the point here is, is that it's how you use the vehicle or the car determines whether or not it's at fault. Does that make sense? So it's the same with the trust structure or any type of structure. You get in it and drive it incorrectly, then they're going to they're gonna turn around and say, you can't do that. And when those that don't understand the law will say, see, trusts are bad. That's like saying Volvos are bad. No, 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 it's the driver that's bad. Does that make sense? Okay. How many of you think that trusts and these companies and structures are going to be stopped at some point in time? 
How many of you actually think that? All right, well, let me ask this question. How many politicians do you reckon have trust in companies? So how many do you reckon are going to actually stop it? No. How many wealthy people that fund the politicians have trust in companies and so on? Exactly. You see, the way our system works is, and not a lot of people understand this, is that the ATO are actually not the law. The ATO are there to enforce the law. Welcome. Some seats down there. The ATO are there to enforce the law, and the ATO have an interpretation of the law which is sometimes not correct. And the reason I can say that is because they take a person to court and they lose sometimes. Right? And this is how our system works. The ATO have an, have an interpretation, uh, someone else has an interpretation or a taxpayer. They go to court and the court will decide, and that court becomes the precedent of how the law is applied. Does that make sense? A rather complicated system. You would think we could just write the law so it was nice and clear. Right? But it doesn't, it's not the way it works. And quite often, the ATL will take a view that is actually contrary to certain positions and what a lot of people think. Of course, if you're wealthy enough, you, you would take it to court and fight it. But really, our stand on this is, you know, there's no reason to really pick a fight if you don't have to. It's much easier to navigate through this swamp and do what is legal and what, uh, you know, the ATL like or don't dislike too much and so on. Does that make sense? I should probably start that, that conversation with, is anyone from the ATO here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so use the vehicle in the incorrect way just for tax reasons doesn't work. So what reasons do you need to make sure you've got in the, in the, the whole idea of what you're doing structure-wise, what else do you need to take into account? Answers on the screen. Yeah? Asset protection and estate planning. Well, let's, let's talk about what they are. So, <clears throat> firstly, asset protection is, is this concept of, in, for every single one of you, there is what is a protected area and there is a non-protected area. Or I should say unprotected. See, if you as an individual own a property, this is a non-protected area. Okay? If you put it in a trust, this property is put into a trust, this becomes, is this is a protected area. Why is that? Well, simply because you don't own it. Now, what do I mean by non-protected area? Well, for those of you who are in business, we all have a certain degree of risk. If you're an employee, your risk is limited. If you're a business owner or a director in business, your risk starts to increase. And depending on what kind of business you're in or industry you're in, your risk can go through the roof. Surgeons, for example, can be sued 20 years after their last operation. Right? This is a high risk area of being, um, of having you know, stuff in a non-protected area. Um, a quick little story on this, actually, was um, there was, a, there was a, uh, a builder that we had as a client, and uh, they, were, they were working on a hospital. And on the site, they had an external fridge which had all the blood in it for the hospital, the blood bank. And they were working on the site. And one of the contractors kicked off the electrical cord to the blood bank. So all the blood went bad. So what happened to people in hospital who needed blood? Well, as you can imagine, it got pretty messy. Right? So who sued who? Well, the hospital... The, uh, the family members of those that uh, had difficulties in operations or died sued the hospital. The hospital sued who? The builder, which is our client. And then the builder had to sue the contractor, who basically had no insurance. So the builder, because he was the wealthy individual, he was the one who got taken to the cleaners. Right? Because his accountant had told him to put properties in whose name? His name for the tax reasons. See? Now this is a scenario, quite a dramatic example, but this is a scenario of it's not directly his fault, is it? He's happened to be doing a job on a particular site. So, protected area, non-protected area, the whole idea behind asset protection is making sure your assets are over here and you have nothing here. Does that make sense, guys? Now, if you do have a property here and you transfer it to a protected area, what do you pay? Stamp duty. That's right. Stamp duty, capital gains tax, because it's like selling. You're changing ownership. It's like selling the property. But we can show you a ways around that later on. Okay? So that's asset protection. 
Now let's look at whoops. Let's look at estate planning. Estate planning is simply the idea of passing on assets from one generation to the next, but doing it in a tax-free way. Okay, so you're not, not having to pay tax each time it gets transferred. In fact, what you're passing on to each generation is not the asset. What do you think you're passing on? Control. control. That's right. You pass on control to the next generation, not the asset itself. And we'll talk more about that. So you can actually, you can control the assets to a degree that when you pass them on to your, uh, your daughters or your, you know, your, your sons, your children and their children and so on, you can actually set it up in such a way as they're not allowed to sell the assets or the assets remain just in your family and follow your bloodline. Okay, you can do lots of different things. This is called controlling it from the grave. Right. This is where you get the last laugh. You know? You're gone and they try to sell the asset to buy a Ferrari and the lawyer says, sorry, you're not allowed to. And you, <laughs> they can hear you laughing. <laughs> Flexibility of distributing income, as mentioned, is simply the idea of spreading your income around and taking advantages of the different tax thresholds that everybody has. So those are the three. So the key concept here is structures are used for asset protection, estate planning, and flexible distribution, and dare I say, in that order of priority. Those three. Now, I forgot to mention actually at the beginning, if, if there's anything I say that you don't quite get or you want clarification, by all means pop your hand up. We'll see how we go. If uh, your questions get too many, I'll uh, wait till the break or the end and I'll answer them. You got one already? Yes? Okay. For the asset protection, when yes. you mentioned it depends you know, on the vehicle, what if you don't have a business and you want to put a house into the protected side, but you, you don't have a business that somebody that can sue you, you don't yeah. have that. So the only benefit you would gain, perhaps, is the tax benefit if you do that. Is that still okay? Um, do you have children, may I ask? No. No? no. Okay, when, when you've got children, then it's always easy to justify asset protection and estate planning. Um, if, you're just, if you're doing the transfer just for tax purposes, with no other reason, it, it comes down to how you document it. Let, let me put it this way. For example, right, there was a gentleman who set up a trust. This is an actual court case. He set up a trust. He bought a property in the trust. I'll just draw this for you. Do you want me to share this with you? Yeah. yeah. So this is what he did. <coughs> he bought a property in a trust and he borrowed the money from the bank himself. Now this is how you can make it a tax deduction personally. So he borrows the money from the bank and then he invests in the trust so he gets back units. Now when you make an investment, is the interest tax deductible? Yes, yes it is. So this property is, uh, is sitting here owned by the trust now. So he's got asset protection and so forth because he's not owned in his own name, but he's got the tax benefit in his own name. Nothing wrong with this, all totally fine. Um, the, he got audited by the ATO. And the ATO looked at it, he'd had this property several years and he was still losing money. So he's still, he's not receiving any really much income or any income at all from this investment. So he's losing money. And when they asked him, and his accountant. When will you make money from this investment? What do you think his answer was? Sell it. Huh? Right. What would your answer be? If I said, when would you make money from this investment? What would your answer be? Sell it. When you sell it, okay. Which may be when? Five years? Ten years? Okay, well let me ask you this. How many of you would make an investment and lose money constantly? Right. So you've got to be smart about this. His answer was, never. <laughs> you see? Like right, Homer Simpson, right? Don't. <laughs> so they said, so we can't do it. Why would you make a commercial investment and lose money forever? What he should have said, and what we, what we teach you to do, is you have a spreadsheet. You say, here's my projections. This is what I'm hoping it will achieve. Okay, fine. Most properties turn out to be negatively geared, sorry, uh, neutrally geared or positively geared after about five years, uh, sorry, seven years, don't they? It's natural. You put a cash flow projection together and say, well, I reckon in seven years they would have taken that and gone, okay, fair enough, no problem, keep going. But him and his accountant said never. <laughs> That's how silly you can be. So you don't have to talk about necessarily asset protection, you just have to have a decent investment plan as well to go with it. Does that make sense? All right. I'll tell you all sorts of funny stories like that. 
Make it funnier and funnier when I drink beer and stuff like that. <laughs> tax rates. Who knows? Who's aware that our tax rates jumped up significantly at June, July 1 this year? One, two, three, four, five, only about wow, 20 people. I think this is a very sad state of affairs that the rest of you didn't put your hand up. We've now gotten so used to the whole system that tax gets taken out before we get it that it goes up and we don't even know. This is what, this is what tax rates were um, as of June tw uh, 30 this year. You paid 15 cents for every dollar you earn over 6,000, between 6,000 and 37,000, you're paying 15% tax. Plus the Medicare levy, which is 1.5%. Medicare levy on top of that, so it's 16.5%. Levy is just a four letter word for tax. <laughs> uh -huh. this is, the reason I'm sharing this with you is quite significant. This is pretty much the level of where you would want to be. When people ask, when should I set up a trust? It really came down to, well, obviously there needs to be some sort of financial benefit. When you look at this area here, once you started earning over 80000 you started paying 30% tax, or 31.5%, right? You started paying over 30% tax. Prior to that, you were paying less than 30%. So what figure, income-wise, would you want to start looking at maybe setting up structures? When your income goes over 80, make sense? All right, good. Once you did that, you jumped up to 37% and it went over and higher. That was up until June 30. Now, July 1, they've changed. Look at this, 19%. It's the lowest tax rate has gone from 15 to 19. What percentage jump is that? Hmm? Who knows your math? <laughs> Let's have a look at this. It's gone from 15 to 19%. Most people say, oh, it's only a 4% jump. No, it's not. If you times 15 by 20%, what do you get? 18%. It's more, more than a 20% jump in tax rate. Isn't that a lot? Isn't it? Not only that, this uh, next level here went up to 32.5%. So now, once you earn over $37,000, you're now paying 32.5, plus the Medicare levy is 34% in tax. So at what rate do you want to start looking at structuring? 37,000, that's quite a jump, isn't it? Quite a significant change. Okay. See, because you can cap your tax rate at 30% if you know how to structure yourself. And I'll show you how to do that tonight. Who feels depressed now? <laughs> okay, we've achieved my aim so far. Yes, sir. So, basics of trust. Let's get into how we set all these things up. Some of this will be revision for you. Those who've read the textbook, but uh, we'll also make sure everyone's on the same page. So, the function of a trust is to um, to do with ownership and control. Okay, so when you go out and buy a house, you both, if you buy it in your own name, you control it and you own it. Okay, those things come together. When you use a trust or a structure of sorts, what it is is a piece of paper, it's a document or a deed. Deed simply means do. It explains what the trust is able to do. You separate the ownership and the control factor. Now by separating them, if you don't own something, can it be taken from you? No, it's as simple as that. Okay? That's the whole concept behind this. Because if you don't own it, then you can spread the money around, you can decide where it goes when you die, with state planning, and you've got asset protection because you don't actually own it. And that locks in your assets, okay? That's a protection method. The whole concept then is to simply own nothing and control everything. This is quite opposite to the way we're brought up, buy your house, pay it off, own it, and all the rest of it. You don't want to own it, you just want to use it, you know? There's so some saying, you know, we're just passing through time, you just, you know, want to use it while you're here kind of thing. Pass it, yes. Would you apply, apply the same to your own personal residential house? Depending on, uh, uh, lady, I thought was your name? Jude. Jude. Jude asks, would you do it for your own property? It really depends, your own home that is, depends how much of a risky industry you're in, number one. Number two, it also depends whether you can get the finance. You see, I talk a lot about this trust structures and stuff like that, and I often get people coming up to me at these events 
I had one gentleman come up to me actually, rather depressed at the end of it, uh, which is not my purpose in life to depress people, but he came up and he said to me, all depressed, it was quite funny, he said, oh Tony, after listening to you, I realise I've done it all wrong. This is terrible. I, I, you know, I'm in a high risk industry, I've got all my assets in my own name, I've got seven million dollars worth of property, I'm, I've done it completely wrong. I go, look, if it's that big a deal, mate, just put it in my name. <laughs> You see, the most important aspect of this game is you play the game, right? You can always fix things up. You can always protect things later, and I'll show you how. But never, ever, ever let trust structuring or whatever else stop you from investing. Does this make sense, guys? So, to answer your question is, it depends. If you can't get the finance by putting it in a structure, forget about it. Get the property, right? If you're high risk, you might need to protect it. But I'll show you how to protect assets in your own name without having to pay step, capital gains tax or stamp duty for transferring them. I will show you that. You enjoying this stuff, folks? Yes. yes. Did you ever think tax and accounting and legal could be so exciting and thrilling? <laughs> hey? All right, discretionary trusts. <clears throat> Unit trusts and hybrid trusts. These are the three most popular types of trusts. There are a lot more. But we'll cover these so that you know um, how they work and you understand the concept. So discretionary simply means to have freedom to decide. A family trust is a type of discretionary trust. A lot of people think they've got a family trust, but a family trust is specific only to your family, only the people that are related to you. Most trusts, however, are fairly generic. That means anyone can be a beneficiary, any company you're a part of, and so on. They usually are quite generic in the way that they're written. The trustee, that is. This is what they look like. You've got a trustee which controls the trust, assets are held in the trust, and you are a beneficiary. B stands for beneficiary. Money or income in the trust, when spread out, can go to either of the beneficiaries depending on what the trustee decides. So that's how a trust works. You can spread the money around. <clears throat> a unit trust is split up into units, much like a company is split up into shares. There are different types of units in a unit trust. You can have capital units, income and ordinary. So if you've got capital, what do you reckon that entitles you to if you own the capital units? <coughs> capital growth, right? So if you buy a property for 200000 and sell it for a million, you've made 800000 capital. The people who own the capital units can share in that capital. Okay? The rent from the property, if you uh, rent it out, is income. The only ones that are entitled to income are the ones that earn the income units. Does that make sense? So now you can split income and capital to different people or different entities depending on what you're doing. Again, lots of advantages in doing that depending on your strategy. Ordinary units allow you to do both. You can give, give the ordinary unit holders capital or income, doesn't matter. This is what it looks like. Spoken to units and the unit holders are entitled to their share of the income or capital depending on what type of units they've got. Make sense, guys? Yep. Yeah? All right. Next one is hybrid. Hybrid simply means a cross between things, and a hybrid basically allows you to have units and discretionary aspect to the trust. So you can have a discretionary portion and a unit portion. Quite a useful structure for investing, and also quite a useful structure for business as well. Um, who's heard that uh, the it's really hard to get loans and things with hybrid trusts in particular. Who's heard that one? Yeah. Just to give you a bit of a, an idea behind this, right? at a certain level of banking and finance, you talk to people about these things and they've got no idea what you're talking about. You know, a number of times, if I just got a dollar for every time I had to take out a napkin or a piece of paper and draw the pictures and explain it, when you get to commercial banking or bigger deals, the question is, so which entity is this going in? You know what I mean? It's completely different. And all it actually has to do with is a lack of education. I, I was actually with, a, um, with my bank. Um, I live in the Sunshine Coast, and, and I was with the, the bank up there, all pretty chilled out in the Sunshine Coast, you know. And I was there, and uh, they call me by name when I walk in, and I sit down, and I've got this structure I'm setting up, and the lady's on the phone, and she's got no idea how, what, what this whole, how this whole thing works. And I said, don't they train you on any of this stuff? She goes, no, we get, don't get any training. She sets up bank accounts. She goes, oh, she goes, I have no idea what this, what this stuff means. And I go, well, here's my book, how to leverage your tax. Read that and it'll help you. 
And then she goes, when I see her again, she goes, your book should be given to every employee in the country. I go, good idea, why don't you tell them that? <laughs> they just simply don't get taught it. Now, when you've got a company, um, oh, sorry, what you, you yourself can be a trustee, but what is more common is rather than you as trustee, you have a company as trustee, and you are the director of the company. So you control the company, the company controls the trust. Why do you do this? If you put yourself down as a direct as a trustee, when you buy a property, for example, or any type of asset, you put down your name as owner. Right? So we'd say Tony Melvin, and you could put as trustee, you don't have to, but you could put as trustee and so on. But what you have to then do, people can then search and find out what assets you own fairly easily. Then you have to prove you don't own it by showing what's in a trust. So you've got this added step. But if you have a company as trustee, how easy is it to find out what assets you own? It's pretty hard. Right? It's pretty hard you have to know what companies are and search for the companies and so on. So what you have is an added layer of asset protection. It's very hard to find out what you own because basically your name is nowhere on these things. Does that make sense? This is why company is often used as a trustee. Now, <coughs> minus family. There's a seat down here at the front if you want to sit down at the front. Best seat in the house. Now there is this thing as a minus penalty you need to be aware of when it comes to trust structures. If you have children as beneficiaries, there is a penalty put on distributing money to children that are under the age of 18. So it's called the minus penalty, and this is the rule, that those under the age of 18 who don't work for the money they receive are subject to the minus penalty. They basically get $416 tax free, then over 1307 is 45% tax rate. Right. So now having lots and lots of kids is no longer a valid tax strategy. Okay, you have to adopt them at age 18, you know, like uh, what's it, Angelina and Brad Pitt, you know, just keep adopting them. There are trusts that, that um, don't have a minus penalty apply to them. I'll show you what they are before we wrap up tonight. Yes? Well, if they, if they, uh, if you've got a child who works at McDonald's, for example, personal exertion, they're only, they're going to get taxed like a normal adult, normal tax rates. You can employ them in your trust. Okay, might be a bit hard to employ this little fella in your trust, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when they're two, you take out the garbage. <laughs> you could certainly employ them to do certain work that's reasonable, yeah? and pay them that way rather than. As a, as a distribution. <laughs> Just make sure they don't join a union or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I like your thinking, by the way. That lady asked that question out of back. Get them working. Bucket company. This is a complete side note for me to get on my soapbox. You know, I think I think it's a crime that we let our children. We we don't let our children work earlier. You know, this whole idea of educating and educating and educating. I had my first business when I was 15. Nice. You know, like just this whole idea of learning, learning, learning. Richard Branson, actually, there's a great article Richard Branson said. He said, everything in the world is speeding up. You can, you can get information faster. You can, um, you know, set up businesses, do financial transactions. You can do all these things much faster. And the only thing that hasn't sped up is how fast we educate our kids. That's slowed down. <coughs> Does that make any sense? Yes. Isn't that weird? It's just wild, you know. I've got, I got two kids, actually two and a half. I've got number three on the way. Yes. Proof that I do go home every now and then. <laughs> but, um, you know, for me, the lesson I'm passing on to my child or children are how to find answers for yourself. That's the most important skill. Yeah? Because in this day, it's so easy to do, isn't it? That's what this is all about. You know, no one taught me this stuff. I just had to go and find answers. I just kept asking one question, one word question. You know what it is? Why? No, you can't do this. Why? Why? Because you can't. But why? You know? <laughs> I know the hell out of people. Change lawyers. Ask another one. So that to me is a great skill. So this whole idea of educating and making them not, not work for a long time, you know? Crime goes up. Very interesting statistics. Correlate. 
the longer we keep trying to educate and not work. Bucket company, let's get technical. So, <clears throat> some people are in the unfortunate position of having too much money. Right? <laughs> and then they make lots of profit, they have beneficiaries down here that are all in the high tax rate. Right? 45 and 38 and whatever it is now, 40 or something. And they get this situation that if they've got a million dollars here of profit, that they can't really give it to any beneficiary because they'll obviously pay too much tax. Or more than than they need to. So what used to happen as a very technical term, this was called a bucket company. So this was a company. What's the tax rate of a company? Thirty percent. Thank you. So what you could do is is you put the million dollars in the company, and you'd only pay three hundred thousand dollars in tax. All right. Now let me highlight um, a particular way that you we that trust uh, actually use for those of you who don't know this. If you had an 18-year-old son or daughter, all right, 18 years old, let's say they didn't earn anything, had no income, you could distribute to them money. So let's say we distribute to them $50,000. Now, that's a bit hard for you to see. So we distribute $50,000. Now, the tax on $50,000 is about $12,000, right? probably a bit more now. To say 12,000. Now, how many of you would be confident that if you gave your son or daughter who's 18 years old $50,000 cash, put it in their bank account, and expected to get any of it back? <laughs> would it happen? No. no. So, what, what always happened with beneficiaries is you never actually gave them the money. What you gave them is nothing. What happened is, is you would say to your your child, you earned fifty thousand dollars this year. Your tax return is twelve grand. Sign there. We're paying the tax for you. Thank you very much. All right, go away. <laughs> so what happens is, is the tax, the twelve k gets spent, sent to the ATO on their behalf, and the other amount stays in the trust. So the other thirty eight k stays in the trust, and you now have a loan to the beneficiary. Does that make sense? You, the trust owns the beneficiary, thirty-eight grand. Do you all follow? Yes. All right. Now, when it, over a period of a number of years, do you think this would build up to a significant amount? Yes. It would. Now, do you think that this child has a right to this money? Yep. Can they sue to get this money? Yes. Have there been cases where this has happened? Yes. Yeah. We had one client, still a client actually, and the. Um, the daughter married this wonderful gentleman. <laughs> married the daughter. At one time, he looked at his, his wife's tax return. He said, "You know, your your dad's trust owes you half a million bucks. I think it was half a million. It might have been two million. And she goes, "Oh no, I didn't know that. Whatever." And he goes, "Well, you should get that." So he, the 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 son-in-law convinces the daughter to take dad to court, and they win. And yet, pay. And now they don't go to Christmas parties together. <laughs> so, <clears throat> as a tip, by the way, who's doing this? Who's distributing money out of a trust and has loans to beneficiaries? Okay. What your accountant should be doing is adding back this loan, keeping this loan down. Now, the way that you do that is you basically charge for certain expenses. You know? Nappies add up to an awful lot of money. <laughs> Education, board, travel. I'm serious. You add this back and you bring down that loan. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because you never know who they're going to marry. Right? <laughs> you never know. You always should keep those loans down. Right? You should always add, keep them as low as possible. So this is all totally fine. It's okay to loan the money. Well, sorry, uh, pay the tax, keep the money, because you want to keep it in the trust, because this is where it's, it's protected. Does that make sense? Okay, now, when you're in a situation where you've got no beneficiaries, or all your beneficiaries in the high tax rate, you loan it to the company, 
ideally what happens is you put 300k taxes paid here and the other 700k sits in the trust, yeah? yeah. Well, you can't do this anymore. Right. And the reason is this. There is a rule called Division 7A. Division 7A is all about loaning out of a company. Now what used to happen in the good old days is you could loan money from your company, never pay it back, and the company goes broke, so you set it up a new one. How much tax do you pay when you borrow money? It's all right, because it's not income. If you take equity out of your home, you take $100,000 out of your home, like a home loan, and put it in your back pocket, how much tax do you pay? Zero. Zero. This, by the way, is how the game is played at the, at the higher end. You know, living off equity is no tax. The way you do it, though, you've got to make sure that the value of an asset is continually going up or the income from the asset can afford the interest. Does that make sense? Okay. So you understand then, if you borrow money, you're not paying tax, right? So you had a company making money, kept borrowing, borrowing as a director. Company then, you, you know, runs out of cash, you close it down, and you set up another one, do it again. This was bottom of the harbour, right? Like I said, the good old days. You can't do that anymore. In reality, it's not very ethical to do that. You know, it doesn't build a sustainable economy and all the rest of it. So they stop this with this law called Division 7A. What it basically means is, is that a loan equals a dividend. You take it as a loan, you're really taking it as income, you've got to pay tax on it. That's the simple explanation of Division 7A. You either have to take it as a dividend, as income, or you have to do it as a, correct, as a proper loan that has to be paid back in seven years plus interest at the going uh, Commonwealth Bank rate, I think it is, which is 7.02 at the moment or something like that. Right? So you have to pay it back over seven years with interest. Does this make sense? This stopped, obviously, a lot of people borrowing money from their company. Division 7A became an issue. You can't do it with companies. You all follow? Yeah? All right. <clears throat> They're now applying this to trusts. A uh, tax lawyer buddy of mine, they've written up, I don't know, some 30 or 50 page document uh, called a tax, uh, it's not a ruling actually, I think it's a determination, um, that explains how this applies to trusts. My tax lawyer, he said to me, if he had a uni student produce this document as, a, as part of his essay for his degree, he would have failed him and sent him back to the beginning of the, his uni, uni studies to start again. That's how wrong this is. It, actually, in, in a, it doesn't actually reflect the law. But again, the ATO are taking a stance. Who wants to challenge him in the room? Okay, no takers, so what do we do? Well, we need to abide by it and follow it. Someone will challenge. We're all waiting for a court case for this to start happening. Someone with plenty of money um, where they've got more to lose by not fighting it. So, what it means is, you have to distribute the money into the company if you're going to do it this way. Which defeats the purpose of it all, really, because really now you, you don't have the assets sitting here. So, it causes complications. But there is another way. Would you like to know yes. it? Yes. Just hear you? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. I mean, I can just go home. Yeah, I'll go to my room. Are you sure? Yes. All right. Let me show you how, um, another way around. That. Oh, an important tip. This law, by the way, changed, or they, not so much law, this ruling came out in the 16th of December 2009. Anyone know about it? No? Who has, who has trust distributions that they know of to a company prior to this date? A couple of you. What you need to do, what your accountant needs to do, is you need to isolate that distribution and call it a pre-16 December 2009 distribution. The reason you do that is because as they clamp down on this and audit trusts and things like that, you need to be very clear of what is a pre-16 December 2009 distribution and afterwards. Because what they've done in their um, <coughs> saintly nature is they've allowed everyone to quarantine prior to this date. You don't have to worry about that, anything prior to that date. After that date, you need, a, you need a, basically a loan in place or Division 7A will apply. So make sure your accountant does that, stipulates it on your balance sheet and so on. 
in the trust, nice and clear. That way, you won't run into any issues if you uh, get audited on it or when that when an audit comes through. <clears throat> okay, let me talk to you about a different type of structure that you may not have heard of. These are fairly new limited partnerships. Who's heard of a limited partnership? Okay, not very many people. They've only been around about 100 years, so if you haven't heard of them, that's why. Actually used uh, quite a lot in big business and in uh, venture capital raising and all this sort of stuff. This is, this is how they work. You have a general partner. This can be a company or a trust. Remember, folks, you get a copy of all of these slides and a video of this stuff, so for those of you who maybe missed that at the beginning, you don't have to worry about taking too many notes, although you're most welcome to. So the general partner can be a trust or a company. Then you have a limited partner. And a limited partner can also be a trust or a company. And what happens is, when you've got these two entities, you can have multiple limited partners, by the way, I think up to 20 or 25. They come together and they form a partnership. It's a special type of partnership and you register it with your Office of Fair Trade in, in, uh, in your state, in Victoria. And what you've actually created is a partnership that has some very specific rules attached to it. The split between the general partner and the limited partner is usually 1%, 99%. <clears throat> The great thing about this structure is, there's a number of good things about it actually, is the general partner is the one that takes all the liability. Takes responsibility for the debt of the partnership. So if this partnership got sued, the most you would lose is what? 1% of the value of the partnership. The limited partners are not liable for any debt. They're only liable for the amount of money they've put in or the assets they've put in. The great thing about a limited partnership are as follows. The tax rate is actually 30%. When you register a limited partnership, it actually becomes like a company. It's not a company, but it's treated as a corporate entity. So your tax rate is 30%. So if the limited partnership makes a million dollars, it pays 30% tax. If it makes one dollar, it pays 30% tax. Okay? Your distribution is still flexible because you've actually got trusts in there as a li under the limited partnership. You can still distribute the money out. And the liability is limited to the general partner only. So you have asset protection built in. And it can be deregistered. I'll explain what this is in a minute. But this provides you with estate planning. So let me show you. <coughs> Okay, this is your limited partnership, and you've got the general partner and the limited partner, which is usually set up to be a trust, and you've got beneficiaries here. Now, well, what can happen is, at a time, in any time in the future, you can actually deregister the limited partnership, and what you end up with is just the two entities that you started with. There's no tax implications for doing this or anything. The reason why this may be worthwhile to you is what you can do down in the future is let's say you have uh, three children and you've got a whole bunch of assets here that you've built up over your lifetime. What are the chances of your three kids agreeing on what to do with these assets? <laughs> Zero, right? So rather than you know, cause all sorts of heartaches and legal battles in the future, which happens so often it's, it's rather sad, what you can actually do is set it up so that you could say earmark a particular property or set of properties that go into a trust, one for each child. So these get transferred into a different trust, one for each child, right? At, this is at your death, so you can do this transfer at that time as stipulated in your will and so on. So, for example, the partnership could be deregistered and then this could occur, so assets get transferred out and then each child has their own, you know, uh, portfolio then to continue on with. Does that make sense? So all of this sort of, there's a lot of flexibility with this kind of thing. <clears throat> so, that's the, uh, the basic concept of a limited partnership, but it should also describe this. Because it's a, it gets taxed at 30% as an entity, 
you, if it does make a million dollars, you don't have to distribute the money to anyone. So you're not actually creating a loan. Does that make sense? So it, it pays 300,000 tax, and the 700K sits in, what's left over, sits in your limited partnership, and you go and buy stuff. So there's no distribution, there's no messing around with loans and all those sorts of things. So how could you use this or apply it? Well, a lot of people are in a situation where they've got maybe assets in a trust, and again, in that unfortunate position of having too much money and so on. What you can actually do is you sell off 1% of your trust to a different entity. Now, if you're selling off 1% of your tr trust, you will pay stamp duty and you will pay capital gains tax, right? But you're paying it on 1%. So it's not going to be too much, right? What you've in essence done is you've set up a general partner and this would become the limited partner. And once you've done that step, you then can register a limited partnership. Make sense? What you've in essence done is you've contributed this capital here or these assets here to the limited partnership. The general partners contributed their 1%. You form the limited partnership and away you go. And now your tax rate is 30% and you've got a stronger asset protection base and so on. Does that all make sense, guys? <coughs> what a lot of people don't realise is that the owner of a asset can be sued directly. So you can get a tenant here sue the trust directly. Okay, but if you do this sort of thing, wrap it up in a limited partnership, you, you're putting in a protection mechanism there as well. You follow that? Yeah, so that's, that's the advantage of this. One, one advantage is numerous here, of course. Numerous advantages. Okay, who likes that? Yeah? Pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> so that way, you're, you're, uh, you're avoiding the whole Division 7A issues that uh, come about now with distributions from trust, which uh, is one of the reasons I put on this particular seminar tour, is because you know there's quite a significant change in the way that uh, they're operating. All right, who's got assets in their own name that they want protected? Just a few of you. Okay, let, let me show you how you can do this. It's called a contractual will. So this is the way you do it without having to pay capital gains tax or stamp duty. This is actual real life example of a client we had who um, owned property. He's a surgeon and his accountant prior to him joining the uh, firm I had at the time uh, recommended because he had so much money to buy these properties in what name? No, oh, his own name, yeah. Wife would have been smarter. But because he was the high income earner, what's the negative gearing and so on, buy him in your own name. So he had six million dollars worth of property, right? Which is a, uh, it's like a driveway in a garage in Sydney, <laughs> or uh, or a hotel on the Sunshine Coast. And he had he had six million dollars worth of property, only about a million dollars in debt, so he had five million equity. In if you understand what happens to property every sort of seven ten years in this country in the right areas. Yeah, it just keeps doubling, doesn't it? What's going to happen to his problem in the next 10 or 20 years? Double and double. It's basically going to get bigger and bigger, isn't it? Yeah, and <laughs> good old land tax. And he, um, as I mentioned before, the reason I know that surgeons can be sued 20 years afterwards is because I found out from this particular client. In 20 years, it goes from 6 million to 12 million and then to 24 million. All you need is one person he operated on to find out what he's worth and what do you reckon? <laughs> didn't sew my head on properly and away, away they go so he's got three kids a daughter, two sons and this is the way it works we wrap protection mechanisms around the assets now it's not just the property it, it can be you know, jewellery, art any, any assets that you have get listed in the registry as part of this contractual will so all of your assets and the first layer of protection is a special type of trust gets set up and is a gift of all of the assets for the purposes if it's an inheritance for the children. So it's a gift for the children as an inheritance. So they're still in his name at this point. The assets still, re still remain in his name but he's um, 
under contract, con under a contract, legal contract, he's saying I'm gifting all of this for inheritance for my children. Does that make sense? Yes. There, there is not very many uh, courts that will rule against ripping off the inheritance of children. Right? That's one protection mechanism. The second one is you take a second mortgage over the equity. See, when someone's suing you, what are they actually after? They're actually after your home. No, it would be real creepy, wouldn't it? I want to live in your house, you know? <laughs> sleep in your bed. No, they're after the equity. What happens is if you, if all, you get um, basically sued and you lose, the judge will go, you've got to pay $5 million, bang, and then, what, and then you've got to sell everything and give them the cash. Right? What, you do, what we do here is, is we actually, the doctor takes out a loan because he's gifted these, these assets. He now takes out a loan as part of this and says, I want a loan for $5 million. And the trust says, well, what equity do you have? Or what, what's collateral? And he goes, here's my property. So what does his balance sheet look like? He's got six million of assets, one million of debt to the bank, and a registered second mortgage for five million. What's he worth? <laughs> Nothing. And this is where another lawyer goes, hmm, it's going to be too hard. Forget about it. You see, not much to take. The whole idea is you just scare them off. You make it too hard. The third layer of protection is if the other two fail, there's an option over the properties. So if, if, if the first two fail, then the trust can acquire all of these assets. If that happens, there will be capital gains tax and stamp duty, but um, to my knowledge, that's never happened. The other two scare them away. Okay. You all understand this one? Yes. So now he's still getting the negative gearing benefit if he is negatively geared or whatever, still owns them. So none of this is transferred, okay? It's just a contractual will. Okay, good question. So, a lady asks, he's, he's passing these assets on as a gift of inheritance. Basically, can you still use them? Can you still borrow against it? Yes, you can. What you would have to do, though, is you'd have to change the register, the second mortgage. Because you've got a $5 million debt. So, if you wanted to tap into some of, some of your equity, you'd have to change the second mortgage, borrow up from the bank, and then redo the second mortgage on what's left. Make sense? Because you still own them, you see. He still does own them and control them. But if, it's, if the whole idea is somebody comes after him, they do their research, they see all of this, it just scares them away. They just don't bother. Yes? What's he done with the five million? There's no, there's no actual paper transaction. Oh, sorry, there's no cash transaction. All you're doing is you're creating a debt on the property. Okay? Again, it's a little bit technical, but all, you've got to, all you think about is, he, here's how technical it is, right? We've sucked the equity from here all the way over to there. Been suck. He has no equity left. That's the end result of this. One more, and I'll keep going. Yeah? If you if it doesn't have children, it's um, this this basically doesn't work. Um, you need uh, you need to you basically can't do step one. Well, it doesn't it won't it doesn't stack up as much. Okay, um, you can't really do a gift of inheritance. You can oh you can do it for the wife, but. See, in this whole scenario, the wife's actually not entitled to the assets. This is extra protection, you see. Um, because that, that kind of transfer can be easily undone or clawed back, more so than this one. Right? Um, so you need, either need to get busy. What about your nephews? See, there's benefits coming to my tax seminars, right? <laughs> Never thought of that, huh? Last one, yeah? Nieces and nephews. Yeah, nieces, nephews, anyone. You can put me in here if you want. <laughs> I'll look after it for you. Now. So what does the mortgage state? Like who's... Uh, let's not get too technical on it. Like the mortgage. Uh, all you need to know is that there is a mortgage. Okay. Yeah? And the debt's gone. Uh, the, the equity's okay. gone. Make sense? Okay. Let's keep going. Now. This is a special type of trust for a number of reasons. Number one, it's not subject to minus penalties. So if the assets get passed over to here, and, and he passes away, the doctor passes away, and these children are under the age of 18, they can still get distribu distribution income from the trust, even if they're under 18, and they don't pay a minus penalty. In other words, they get taxed like a normal adult, okay? which is a, a good thing to know. <coughs> now, um, the other added benefit of this is if the daughter falls in love, okay, with the, um, you know, the, the sexy uh, property speaker from Brazil, <laughs> Falls in love and they have instantly two children. All right. 
And then, unfortunately, love doesn't last because he's out doing way too many seminars. Right? Everyone go, oh, oh. love dies. Right? <clears throat> what happens is, is the children or the grandchildren and this surgeon's children are the only ones entitled to the asset. The uh, property speaker, he gets nothing. Because what argument does he have? He goes to court, family law court, and says, well, I want to make sure the children are provided for. Because that's the only reason that they do this, right? They split up assets and so on. Are they provided for? Yes. Huh. What contribution did he make to those assets? Yeah. It's like, go away, buddy. A few people, usually males, ask, what if it's a woman doing this? It's the other way around. Does it still apply? Yes. Yeah. Still apply. So this is keeping it in the blood. You see? You can do that. How does it progress? Good question. So, so I've like got three kids here. What what sort of rights do they have to this? Other, yeah. And, if, they got no and they got no children. Well, this is the cool thing. You can stipulate this. So you can stipulate what what how these assets get split up or what income. You can say you cannot borrow more than fifty percent of the assets. And if you borrow, you can only invest in assets that you know in property or whatever. You can. Like I say, control it from the grave. Okay? Boy, you guys are really getting into this, aren't you? Eh? Yeah. I say, oh, I can do this. A <laughs> couple of more, and I've got to wrap. Keep on going. Is it? Add them to it. It's amazing what comes up with tax seminars, yeah. I was going to ask, what if you were seriously wronged by that doctor, and you wanted to see that doctor for a legitimate thing, and they got nothing, and you got... Well, he would have insurance. Oh, right. Yeah. But generally what happens, just so you know, it's a good question. Right. <clears throat> um, I mean, I... I the whole idea of sharing this with you is not to teach unethical people how to get away with unethical things. You know, it's 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 actually the way around. It's to teach good, honest, hard-working people who've built up wealth to be protected from unethical people. Um, if could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, sure. Um, the lady asked if this guy was a was a was a dodgy doctor, and he did do something wrong, and you wanted to sue him, then all of this sort of stuff would prevent you. There would be insurance. What generally happens is his insurance gets covered, but then if he's proven negligent, the insurance company sue him. So it becomes the insurance company's problem, not so much yours. And that's generally what happens, you know, in most cases. The insurance company will pay out, and then they go after the individual. <clears throat> All right. Um, it, <laughs> so when he kicks the bucket, <laughs> rest in peace, it's at this point that the assets get transferred into this trust that that trust gets actually set up and it's sitting there for the benefit of the family. And the wife, which a few people ask, is entitled to income from the trust, but not the assets. Okay, so the wife is still looked after if she's alive, even when the doctor's passed away. Um, you know, just as a bit of a sad note on this point, you know, of litigation, I spent six months in the, in the States, um, in Florida and LA, and particularly in Florida, it was unbelievable. Every, go down the highway, every single billboard is have you been in a car accident? Did you hurt yourself at work? You know, one after another after another of this concept of just suing someone to get an easy break. You know, and it's if you can see it happening here too. You hear ads on radio and stuff, and it's quite sad that a culture would go that way. Um, I think um, you know one of the main things wrong with America is their frivolous lawsuits. They can that their insurances would go down, everything become more affordable. They wouldn't need to, you know have such ridiculous medical bills, you know. Now, the assets of a trust can be actually um, sued directly. A trust can be sued directly. You get a tenant, trips over the driveway, hurts his foot, decides to sue the owner. Who's the owner? Trust. trust. So you can sue the trust directly. So if, you, if you've got equity building up in here over time, then it serves to actually protect it. Would you agree? Yes. The way you do this is through another trust. And it's a bit like the contractual will I just showed you, but not, not, not exactly the same. What we, in essence, do is the equity is really transferred over here. It's done by creating debt in the original trust. So it's like the second mortgage scenario. So if you build up a million dollars equity in here, we basically create a million dollar second mortgage. How much equity is left? Zero. Asset protected, you see? So this is something that you would look at doing once you've got a certain value of equity in there, and it's something you kind of would revisit every few years in order to top up that second mortgage. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. 
So that's another tip for you, yeah? Um, is that still part of commercial property? Yeah, commercial doesn't matter. Whatever. Not, not even just property, just any, any asset in here. Right. You know? You've got an asset in there, you've got equity, it's increasing in value. You can, you, can you can protect that equity by using another trust and a particular agreement we set up. All right, finance. Last little topic there. How am I doing for time? Oh, good. I'm, I'm running on time. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> I just want to go over a, a mistake we see uh, quite often in doing people's accounts when it comes to loaning um, of borrowing money. Now, actually, I've done this wrong. When you borrow money from a bank and you buy an investment property, is the interest tax deductible? Yes. Yes. yes, it is. Why is it tax deductible? It's because the purpose, yeah? Purpose is to earn income. That's right. Purpose is to earn income. If you borrow money and buy a home, is it a tax deduction? No. Good. Okay. Now, what happens is a lot of people will have a line of credit. So they've bought, you've borrowed a certain amount of money, you know, on your on your on uh, an investment property of say five hundred thousand. This is for an investment property. So you initially borrowed this money for an investment property. Interest tax deductible, nothing wrong with that. What happens is sometimes you are set up whereby your salary, your salary or your wage, gets put into this account and it drops down because you're saving the interest, yeah? It's a good thing to do. Then you take that money out and you buy groceries with it and you buy petrol with it and are these tax deductible things? No. Oh. And what you're doing is you're changing the purpose of the loan. And some people, which I've seen do this awful, awful thing, they'll sell their home, dump the money in here, to save the interest and go and buy another what? Home. And they've completely flipped the purpose of the loan now to a non-deductible non loan. The way to do this <clears throat> is you basically the principle is you keep your, you always pay off your non-deductible debt first. Does that make sense? Your home loan and so on. Always pay that off first because you don't get any tax break for it. If you're going to have debt, you keep, the, the, you keep your deductible debt as high as possible. Because yeah? it serves two purposes. One is a tax deduction, but debt in and of itself is an asset protection. Right? If you've got lots of debt on your investment properties and you own your home outright, that, that, <clears throat> then your, your investment properties are protected. Does that make sense? So another way to do this is, to, is actually use offset accounts. Most banks have them now. If you're using an offset account, you're not changing the purpose of this money, you're just saving the interest. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Better off, you, if you're going to use offsets, you use offsets against your non-deductible debt, all of it. You know? Do it that way. Yeah? Okay. So this is a, well, this is a typical scenario of a person, of a, a people that want to turn their home into an investment property and buy another home. You want to know how to do that? That scenario? Would that... Answer your question, yeah? So when, you, when you're living in a home here, and you want to go, you want to go and buy this home over here, which, which Julio says this one's in Nice Street, but this one's in Nicer Street. If you just go and, and because uh, <clears throat> you want to turn this one into an investment property, right? If you just borrow the money and buy a home, the, the, ta the debt is not tax deductible. What, what in actual fact you need to do is, you, you don't need to do that, is you set up a trust, and this is you, you invest in the trust, there's units, so when you've made an investment, is that tax deductible? Yeah, you've made an investment, good, then the trust buys the home, you get the money, and you buy your home. And all that we've done is just made the purpose a, a, a tax deduction. The purpose of the loan is to make an investment to make money, so you've changed the purpose. Does that make sense? But there's obviously stamp duty that we're going to There would be stamp duty in transferring this over, absolutely. So that's where you've just got to look at the cost-benefit ratio. Yep. You know, 
what does your stamp duty cost you? What's your payback period based on the tax deductibility of the debt? Might be two, three, four years. That's, that's then up to you whether or not you decide to go that way. There's no capital gains tax, of course, because it's a private, um, private residence, so there wouldn't be capital gains tax, only stamp duty. Yes? Can you sell your private home No. You can't, sell, you can't sell assets below market value. That's what Alan Bond went to jail for. So I asked him about it. <laughs> Didn't work for him. So what do you sell? A million dollar painting for two bucks or something? No, you can't do that. You've got you to keep things. See, the whole idea behind what we teach you is to do things right. And you, there are plenty of ways to do it right because you don't want the headache and you want to be able to sleep at night. You all agree? Yeah. There is always um, a way to do it better when you understand more of these things. Like, who's gotten a bit of knowledge just from tonight? Yeah. And, uh, you know, quite honestly, this is like 1% of stuff that you can do. You know, depending on your situation, depending on how much money you make, the, the more money you make, the more wealthy you are, the more you can do. That's unfortunately just how our system works. All right. <clears throat> so we covered the purpose of the line. Okay, so I want to share with you a little bit about Efficient and um, what it's all about. Who here has been business for, them, for themselves, owns a business? Okay, it really applies to you, business owners and investors who fit in one of these categories. If, um, as a business owner or investor, your bookkeeping, accounting, tax lodgement and GST lodgement costs you more than $20,000 per year, then you qualify for this service. So all of those costs added up, what you pay your accountant, what you pay bookkeeper, software, all that stuff. If it's more than $20,000 a year, then you may be interested in this service. You'd qualify for it. Or if you're not spending that much, but you or your spouse spend the majority of your time doing bookkeeping, invoicing, chasing money, and would like to get rid of those tasks, you also potentially qualify for the service. Who here loves bookkeeping? <laughs> One guy. You want a job, mate? I've got plenty of work for you. You sort of love it as well. You like to know what happens. Ah, see, that's different. That's not doing it, though, is it? The data entry? You still do it? That's funny. So, you're the only two that have actually answered yes to that question, by the way, in the whole of Australia so far. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you're in business for yourself, quite often the business owners or their spouses are the ones that end up doing the bookkeeping for that very reason. Control! All right? What's happening with my money? All right? But uh, you may be interested in this service because this is our goal in efficient. We make you efficient, very, very efficient in this whole area. Because when you think about it in business, this is one area that costs you money. It doesn't make you any money doing all the bookkeeping and stuff, right? The other thing is what's basically happening is more and more there's an administration burden put on the business owner or an investor. Would you agree? Yeah. That's what GST is all about. You're all tax collectors. You see? Now, do you think that burden is going to become less or more as time goes on? Yeah, they're not. They don't seem to be letting up, do they? They change the laws, this happens, that happens. So we basically take that headache away from you. We make you more profitable by doing so. We eliminate time-consuming and costly systems and processes. There is not a business I visited yet that doesn't do double or triple entry on multiple systems to achieve a task that can actually be done once or automated. Not one business yet, I've seen. Typical accounting processes look like this. You've got the business owner running around doing what they do best, making money. They're usually, there's a bookkeeper involved and there's an accountant. Usually, bookkeepers are cuter than accountants. <laughs> there's also software involved. And what happens is the bookkeeper, so the business owner has to hire the bookkeeper, they have to buy the software, the bookkeeper enters into the software, then they give it to the accountant, who, if they can actually get the password, can open it up. <laughs> All right? Then they go back and ask the, ask the owner, but what about this? And what did you do here? And what's this for? And then they ask the bookkeeper, how did you do this? And then it all gets very messy. And the whole problem with this is they're dealing with the past. You cannot fix or change the past. It just doesn't happen that way. And the whole of the accounting industry is focused on this one big massive issue of, oh, you did all of this and you made all of this money. How do we fix it now? This is what gets hard, right? And when you think about it, it's such a crazy, crazy system. A crazy system. Who here has had a look at a profit and loss statement, seen the, uh, the positive balance at the end of it, and had that in their bank? 
Not a single hand so far in the whole of Australia. So who looks at a profit and loss statement and goes, oh, cool, I'm making money. Or who looks at it and goes, uh-oh, I'm going to pay a lot of tax on that. Right? In other words, it's, it's a very reactive process. You get to the end, you go, oh, I made that much, really? How come I don't have any money left? <laughs> it's all to do with the past. The efficient system is this. It's very simplified. You as a business owner, deal with an accountant. One accountant dedicated to you. And this accountant only has 20 clients in our system. Our accountants only have 20 clients. The reason that they're able to deal with you and look after you is because of this back-end system and processes that we've set up. We have lots of bookkeepers that work for us. So we assign a bookkeeper to an accountant. We have a cloud-based or internet-based software that is accessible via any mobile device or anywhere you've got access to the internet. The bookkeeper enters the information into the bookkeeping software under the guidance of the accountant. Not the business owner who's got no idea really what it's supposed to be doing, but the accountant who makes sure it's done properly. As every week it's done properly. On top of all of that, with all the major banks, we set up what's called a direct feed, so automatically information is sucked from the banks and put into the accounting system. There's no data entry. And we also set up automated processes that categorise this information. So 60-70% of it becomes automated. Because when you pay Telstra for your Telstra bill, now a computer can read that and go, Telstra, goes to phone. Done. That makes sense. Taxi, goes to where? Travel. Done. Okay? You don't need human beings doing this stuff anymore. So we automate about 60 or 70 percent of it. The bookkeeper picks up the rest, all under the liaison and guidance of the accountant, who liaises with you on a regular basis, makes sure you're heading in the right direction and you're becoming more profitable. We'll get rid of all your paperwork, all your receipts, and all that sort of stuff. The whole thing becomes paperless. You can access anything, anywhere, anytime, as long as you've got an iPhone. And dare I say to Samsung, even though I'm an Apple guy. Right? I'm an Apple guy, but you can buy one of those other devices. But this is hidden from view from you. You don't need to know any of this stuff. You don't need to use the software or anything. If you want to, you can log in. If you don't want to, that's fine. It doesn't matter. We'll send you the reports and the statistics that you need. 20 clients, that's what this can and focus on because we're doing the whole thing for you. So you get a dedicated account that works with you. You don't need a bookkeeper. Where you eliminate paperwork. You get rid of your software. And no need for tedious data entry or multiple systems. All of this we do for a fixed monthly fee of no more than the price of an average bookkeeper. The whole lot. All your tax work done, everything done for the price of an average bookkeeper or sometimes a little bit less. So that's the efficient system. We are doing what's called the efficient assessment. Now I'm personally doing these at the moment as we are launching this whole process. It's $995 and this is what we do. I come to your business. We review all of your structures, make sure you're set up correctly, all the types of trust structures and things that you may have or don't have. We review your current, uh, I just said that, oh sorry, we review your financial procedures, everything you're doing in your business so we can speed it up and improve it. We review your structures, we review your business plans and goals, so you make sure you're heading in the right direction. If you go ahead with our services, then the 995 gets contributed towards it. If we don't think we can help you or improve anything, we'll give you the 995 back. And if you didn't think it was worth it at the end, then we'll just refund you anyway. That's the efficient service. We're going to hand out the forms um, with the ladies now. So if you're interested in that, again, you're spending 20,000 on bookkeeping, tax work, and so on, fill in the form. Or if you are doing the work yourself, or even as an investor, you're spending that, we may be able to help you with it, and we can come and review all of that.